So, Onyengi, thank you so much for making time to share your insights into the future of leadership. Thank you for having me, and uh, it's really an honor to be part of this um, interview today. Thank you. It's great to have you. And before we walk into the future, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Um, where did you grow up? So I am um, I'm a, I'm the first of six children. I grew up in a family of eight yeah. um, um, in the eastern part of Nigeria. Uh, my father is, a, is an entrepreneur and my mom is, um, I would also say an entrepreneur, but more in the academic space. My mother uh, runs um, a number of schools and does a lot of work in property and education. Uh, so I think both my parents are entrepreneurs. I, I want to look at that. I, I normally look at my father as more entrepreneurship in the construction space. And my, my mother is entrepreneurship in the education and property space. Right. And can you tell us what was your dream career when you grew up? <laughs> it's very interesting. My dream career when I was growing up was I wanted to be a doctor uh, because I wanted to save lives. Um, and I felt that if... I couldn't be a doctor, um, then I would settle to be a pharmacist. So I originally felt that I really wanted to be a doctor. I was fascinated with the human body, with everything that has to do with the human body and mind. And I wanted to be part of people who um, help save lives. But uh, it didn't work out that way uh, because I wasn't good in science, maths and science. I loved biology. Biology, I, I was fascinated with biology. I did extremely well in biology, but maths, physics, and chemistry wasn't my best. And uh, my mom then at the time said to me, um, you're very good in the arts. You're very good in English. You're very good in literature. And you've got a, a huge sense of justice and fairness. Why don't you study law? And that's how I pivoted away from being for, from a career in uh, medicine um, to a career in law. Right. And tell us who inspired you in your early days? Well, I, I've always been inspired by people who fought for justice for people. So I'm, I'm inspired by Martin Luther King. Yeah. I have a dream, a dream for an equal society. I'm inspired uh, by people like the old public prosecutor of South Africa, which uh, Tuli Madonsela, who spoke truth against all odds. You know, I'm inspired by people who fight. And that's why I have used people like Martin Luther King, people like um, um, Tuli Madonsela, people like Nelson Mandela, people who suspended their, their personal interest in favor of the greater good. Um, those are the kind of people that that really inspire me and and people who want to build a world that is better because they are in it. And th those are really um, the people that that inspire me, you know, to a very big extent. Also, I'm also inspired by Adrian Gore. It's very interesting to see a man who 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 builds a behavioral model that has been um, adopted. By a lot of people in the in in the not just in the in South Africa but across many many countries in 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 the world, you know, trying to get people to live healthier lives, to make better decisions around their lives, and then developing a commercial model around that. So the how the this um, gentleman has built a business that has helped many people live healthier lives, but at the same time have built it very successfully. In in it's it's quite inspiring for me. And today, Ogenje, you're leading one of the largest NGOs in Africa, Africa Tikkun. Looking back over your career, would you say there was a turning point where things could have gone different? Well, um, I started out as a lawyer, um, working in a, one of the biggest law firms in Nigeria. Um, and I think the turning point in my life is, in fact, when I started getting involved in pro bono legal services, yeah. when I saw how people were, were 
did not have access to legal justice. When I saw how people, people saw how somebody's life can be destroyed by one mistake. And, and when I say destroyed, so let me give you an example. I, when, when my first year, when I started practice of law, I was part of a team that looked at legal justice for awaiting trial prisoners. And um, then in Nigeria, where I come from, um, if you commit a capital offense, which is either rape, um, armed robbery, murder, manslaughter, you cannot um, progress until you have a legal representation because capital offense is, is, is punishable by death. So you can go to, until you have a proper legal representation, you cannot have your day in court. So I was part of a team of lawyers that was recruited to try and reduce the number of awaiting trial prisoners in prisons. And then I all of a sudden realized that there are lots of people who are sitting in prison and the only reason why they are in prison is because they don't have money. And I realized that many of them actually were not did not commit any crime they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and they were picked up but because they didn't have access to funds or financials they were forgotten in prison and i was part of lawyers that represented them and helped them to get their day in court and for those who didn't commit any crime and for which the prosecution had no reason to keep them in prison we were able to get them out of out of prison and some of them had been in prison for five years eight years without legal justice and these people when they got home their families thought they were lost thought they were dead and their families rejoiced because they had been given another opportunity for life and i realized when they came back to thank me that i had the opportunity to change people's life in a meaningful and tangible way and i felt that i didn't just want to be a lawyer that made money transactionally. I didn't just want to be a lawyer that represented the rich and perpetuated wealth for those who had it. Because I have most average lawyers, that's what we do. We represent the rich, we get paid lots of money uh, to represent people and help them to understand the law or to interpret the law or to, pre or to protect their interests when it called their legal interests. But if you look at South Africa, South Africa has the highest Gini coefficient in the world. It has the highest youth unemployment. And part of my, the turning point in my life is realizing that no matter how much money, I was already making six figures uh, before I moved into the field of human rights. And I realized that no matter how much money I made or how much money I got paid, you can't, I don't know how to explain it. You cannot, it does, can never equate to, to changing someone's life. To It feels, I can't explain the feeling. The feeling that you have given someone another lease of life, that you've changed the trajectory of somebody's life, that you've broken generational poverty that you've helped someone to be what they are meant to be. They can be the best they can. So the turning point in my life comes from one, that experience of helping people who were helpless against all odds, people who had no option except languish in prison. And I was able to give them legal justice. That turning point led me to come to South Africa and study human rights and democratization in Africa and study good governance. That really helped me to realize that what I wanted to do with my life is to help other people, is to use my education, use my moral compass, my ethical, my innate ethical interest to help people to access fairness, to access justice, to access their human rights and to use it in my generation. And so that's my turning point. My turning point um, has then driven my entire career. My entire career, whether working for the United Nations as a consultant um, or working uh, directly with companies who work with the United, Nation, uh, United Nations Environmental Program or joining Africa Tikkun, 
you know, as it's now CEO of Africa Ticon Services, I realized that I want to live a life of significance. I want to live a legacy in my lifetime. I want to be remembered that because I existed, people's lives were better. The world was better. The reason why Martin Luther King is remembered is because he had a dream and he went out and fought for that dream. The reason why Florence Nightingale was remembered is that she went out and did things that people were afraid to do. The reason why Mother Teresa was remembered is people who left their footprints, people who existed not because of what they would get for themselves or increasing their self-interest and how much they amassed for themselves. It's about people who want the world to, to, to be better because they are in it. And so for me as the CEO of Africa Ticon and in particular Africa Ticon Services, we want to solve youth unemployment. We recognize that 30 years on after democracy, majority of South Africans are still in poverty. Majority of young people who had believed that their life would be better than that of their parents and their grandparents have not seen a better future. Their lives are, uh, uh, they are they, 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 their lives are, they are still trapped in the cycle of poverty. And so for me, trying to break that, trying to break generational poverty, trying to help young people to come out of unemployment and to have the dignity of being able to put food on their table, the dignity of being able to put uh, a roof over their head, to, to be able to take care of their own children without being dependent on anybody or the state is something that wakes me up every morning and something that makes me want to continue to what, do what I do so that people are able to want to be to be more and to be the best they can. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Onyenye, looking into the future, and I know it's a big question, but what does the future of leadership mean to you? So I think that oftentimes we equate leadership with authority and with power. And for me, the future of leadership is about a group of leaders who realize that we are custodians of, of what we've been entrusted with, whether we've been entrusted with a company, whether we've been entrusted with a country, whether we've been entrusted with people, that being custodians means that there's a responsibility and an accountability to make sure that we do the best we can with what we are custodians of. So I believe that the future of leadership is about people leading in a collaborative way rather than a competitive way. People leading with empathy. People leading with the intention to make to bring, to, to help people to become the best they can. And the, the future of leadership is no longer about um, direct, uh, just providing direction. It's more about um, harnessing the best in people and enabling people to become, to, to use their qualities, to use their um, their innate abilities and capabilities to build a better world. And I, and I say this because we're sitting in a continent where we are, we are blessed with, um, with abundant resources. We are blessed with a youthful population. We are blessed with the beautiful and wonderful weather and environmental landscape. And yet, majority of our people are living in poverty. Majority of our people, if you look at the level of depression and mental, me mental illness and drugs and gangsterism, and you wonder why. Why? Because our leaders are not, no longer, everybody is now living for themselves as opposed to living for each other. And the concept of Ubuntu is lost. The Ubuntu, concept of Ubuntu, which is the concept that drives African leadership, that, that we are, I am because we are, and we are because I am, 
that we are no longer we're not living for oneself but we're living for the greater good so in my in my opinion the future of leadership is about raising strong leaders young old professional um educated not educated raising that leadership is no longer about hierarchy Leadership is about everybody who wants to see a better country, a better continent, a better world, taking the responsibility to drive a country, a continent, a company that will give us the kind of results we all want. And Thank in you. my opinion, what that means is, is that we really want to have seven leaders transformational leaders and leaders who are enablers of change. Thank you. Now, Onyenye, what have you learned from your own leadership journey that you consider most important for building future leaders? In other words, what do we have to do more to build, to empower, to encourage future leaders? A wise man often said, um, I talked about the concept of responsible kindness. I think as leaders, we need to first recognize that we're humans first and therefore um, learn to be kind to each other. Because I think we've come to a place where we, are, we, we have lost our ability to recognize the humanity in others. And so as leaders to first be kind to others, but then to be responsibly kind, to hold people accountable to the ideals, to the standards that we collectively believe we should be um, 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 aspiring to, to, to have. So I, I want to advocate for responsible kindness um, and responsible kindness across board. I want to advocate for mentorship. We need to have more leaders who are, who are leading by example, Leading by in uh, leading in front by showing what what good leadership looks like, but more importantly, lifting as we rise. There are lots of leaders who are breaking glass ceilings, doing wonderful things, but they are not lifting others alongside them. So we would I'd like to challenge a lot of our leaders to start thinking about how do we lift as many people through mentorship, through coaching, through Helping other people to become better leaders, especially our young, our young people. And also in terms of how other ways to raise leaders would be to, um, to look at um, forums of, of giving of their times. I think a lot of leaders uh, spend a lot of time in their nice fancy offices and, and I mean it running their businesses. But I think that our generation, especially the current young youth, uh, youth generation, will do with a lot of our leaders coming down from their 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 places of their towers, their fancy offices, and coming down to the people and and running things like master classes that and sharing their experiences, sharing their knowledge, sharing, you know, their wisdom to help more and more young people and other aspiring leaders. Um, to to learn it to one or two things from there from them. Now, Onyenye, these are challenging times as a world is stumbling from one crisis into the into the next. What is your advice for future leaders in terms of challenges? What are some of the biggest challenges they should expect to encounter in their career, and how should they go about overcoming these challenges? So we're living in a buka world in a volatile, uncertain um, world where everything is ambiguous. We don't know what to expect at any point in time. My advice to future leaders, given the challenges that we are facing, whether they are economic challenges or social challenges or uh, environmental challenges or health-related challenges like COVID-19, that one of the thing, one of the thing that is that we know is constant is change. Change is constant, and therefore we as leaders must learn how to navigate change. And how do we learn how to navigate change? We learn how to navigate change by 
learning how to be agile. Agility is required in the current economic landscape. In addition to agility, we need to be more adaptable. So as ad adaptable, in fact, um, some people call it pivoting, that we learn how to pivot. In a challenging yeah. environment, you, um, it's no longer, you can't have a plan and say, this is the plan and I must stick to the plan until I see success. Because things are changing rapidly, the biggest, the best leaders are leaders who can adapt, who can exercise agility, who have resilience and grit and are able to weather through very difficult circumstances with, without losing their, their, their themselves. Uh, leaders who have an ethical mindset. I think that it's easy in challenging times to try and cut corners, to try and uh, take shortcuts. But the truth is that we've seen that every time shortcuts and and uh, and um, uh, ethical, uh, there is failure in ethical considerations, we see a worse result. So I think more than ever, we need leaders who can, um, who are very clear in relation to their ethical standards and who would push through even in challenging circumstances based on those ethical standards. We also need leaders who are authentic. I think more than ever, we need to lead with authenticity and more so lead with vulnerability because things are changing so much and so fast. It's better to be vulnerable to our teams and to our peers and in that vulnerability, co come up with solutions that will enable us to co-create something meaningful. And so in, in, in concluding the answer to this question, I think that, that there's a lot of things that we can do differently given the challenges that we face. One is being a lot more authentic, looking at ad adapting, being agile. Um, but I also want to add collaboration. Collaboration is what will enable us to put to, to, to advance. Because I believe that in the current economic landscape, in the current socioeconomic landscape and environmental challenges, the people who win are the people who collaborate, are the people who realize that no one person can achieve by themselves, not even one company, that the more we come together, and do things together through collaboration, the, the more we can win together. Now, as a mentor to future leaders, can you maybe share a success story or two where you mentored an upcoming leader and that person took your advice to heart? Well, I've mentored a lot of people um, and I've seen them success. One of my my... My superpowers is is being able to help people to be their best self, to help them to to achieve beyond their imagination, and I stretch people to think to do things that they could never even have imagined themselves doing. So maybe let me use the most recent example. Um, most recently, I met a young man. I I drove into an office park uh, where I was having a I was having a meeting. Um, and when I got into that office park, a young man walked up to me and said, hi, Mam Oni. I, I greeted the young man and the young man said to me, do you remember me? I said, no. He said, I was one of your students in 2019 that graduated from your uh, ICT program. And I said, what are you doing here in this office park in Bryanston? I think it was 22 Sloan Street. And he said to me, I have an office here. And I said, wow, you have an office here? He said, yes, I, I, I run my business from here in Bryanston. So I said, okay, I'm going into a meeting. When I come back out of that meeting, can I get, can I come and see your office? Because I'm quite excited about what you've achieved. For you to be, you know, in an office pack like this means you've done well for yourself. And uh, after, uh, to cut a long story short, after my meeting, I went to see him. And uh, through, surely, uh, surely he was waiting for me, waiting for me. And I went to see his office, 
this young man, after graduating from our program and having been mentored by us, have built a business that now employs 12 people from nothing. This man was unemployed. This young boy, young man was unemployed when he met us in 2019. Within a first space of two years, in a COVID, a COVID uh, and post-COVID economy, he had built a business that employs 12 people. He had built a business that uh, he were, he, that he is turning 4 million rands every year. And he's currently turning 4 million as we speak. And his turnover for the current financial year is 4 million rands plus. He is, you know, his major clients are MTN and Rain. And, and I was amazed. You know, this is a young man that we didn't just give skills, we mentored, and today he is doing exceptionally well for himself. He is a, he's an employer of people. He is a, running a, a million a million rand business. He is, you know, and he he is. I was so proud of him because you don't often see this. You know, we often celebrate just your, the young people that we have mentored and helped to get jobs. We've seen young people go from jobs of starting off with no employment, no income. And we see them go into their first jobs of 5,000 rands a month and then very quickly go into a job of 42,000. I've met young people in Investec on the streets of Investec, on those corridors of Investec as I walk around telling me I'm now a manager in Investec because you invested in me, because you mentored me. So I, I, the stories, the story, the, what warms my heart is when I see young people who, when they started out with us, they had nothing. They were trapped in poverty. They did not see a future for themselves. But then fast forward a couple of years later, they are in high paying jobs, paying them more than their fathers, their mothers or grandfathers could ever have seen in their lifetime. They are running million, million rand businesses. They are employing their fellow young people. And, and some of the people they're employing are our alumni. Because when I went to the office, some of the young people that were in that office were other alumni of Africa Ticon, employed by this entrepreneur, who, whom was a, who was a graduate of our program. So I guys, I want to say this, and I'm saying this because many times we choose to dwell on what is not working. On what's on on the huge unemployment we have in the country, the huge crime we have in the country, the huge um, uh, gender-based violence we have in the country, the huge drug problems we have, but many times we don't count our blessings. We fail to celebrate the successes. And every year, last year, as Africa Tikkun Services, we recruited and trained nine thousand young people, of which we placed eight thousand in jobs. Close to 80% of those young people are earning minimum wage. Those young people pre-2022 had nothing. And so I think that a lot of times we focus on what's not going well. And I don't believe that we're celebrating enough the, the, the young people that we're raising and who have become their, the architects of their own destiny because we have given them a platform and we have facilitated a different future for them. Now, looking back over your own leadership journey, are there any role models of leadership that you encountered, I mean, encountered personally, and that you would recommend future leaders should learn from? So I do, I do, I have a number of role models that uh, I think um, that I could speak about. One, um, one is the late founder of Africa Ticon, Betty Lobner. Betty Lobner was a man who he 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 and his brother Ronnie Lobner started PG Glass many years ago. It's very easy for you to start a business and amass wealth, and they have they have built PG Glass to be one of the most successful glass companies in the world. It's known as Bell Run. Is known as Safe Clyde in America. They are, beach, PG Glass is now in 33 countries all over the world. P, it, Betty Lobner, as a result, and his brother started many not-for-profit organizations of which Africa Ticon is one of them. 
the, this family recognized, the Lovna family, that life is not just about wealth. Life is about living, about recognizing that you live in a society that needs to needs to feel or experience you better or be better because you are in it. And this, as a result of Veti Lobna, Africa Tikkun was formed in 1994. Veti Lobna's leadership is the leadership of a man who truly loves people. I've never met a family that, and Betty, Betty's son, Mark Lobna, is the current group CEO of Africa Tikkun. And this family have demonstrated deep care for those who don't have but not care in a patronizing way. Care in a way. I would see Betty cry, literally cry. And I also see it in Mark, who is this group CEO of Africa Ticon, cry when they see people suffering. Fight. Mark, for example, Mark Lobner went to Charlotte Mark Leclerc yesterday to go and fight for so a, a person with disability who was in a queue, the whole, who had a heart attack, I was transferred to the public hospital, but was left in the public hospital um, on the queue waiting for a bed. And he, he went, he told me that he was going to go and stand in front of uh, the CEO's office of Charlotte until, until a bed is found for that child. So people, leaders who care to the point that they will do anything to make other people's lives better. They will challenge status quo. They are not willing to allow injustice, irrespective of what kind of injustice to exist. And they will not settle until they see other people's life get better. Those are the kind of leaders that inspire me. And those leaders are people like Betty Lobner, who love deeply and care, people, care for people deeply and did not just speak about it, did not just advocate for other people's rights, but took a large majority of their wealth and invested in organizations like ourselves so that we can make other people's life better. Same as Mark, Mark, his son, who has the same principle of understanding Tikkun and what it stands for. Just give me a second quickly. So those two people... Those two people have stood out for me, you know, I, not because I, I am part of the organization, but because there are very few people who love and love deeply, who, who care and care deeply, who want the, their generation to become better and their generations after them to become better because they existed. And Betty Lobner and Mark Lobner, who are, the founders of this organization have demonstrated deep empathy for people and would go out of their way even to their own physical, possible physical harm to fight for the rights and interests and comfort of others. There's not a lot of people in the world like that. We live in a world where people are more narcissist, narcissist, there's more narcissism or narcissistic in nature where people are self-serving. And so when you see people who are willing to lay down their life for others, who are willing to put their, their life in harm's way for others, you've got to respect that. Um, other leaders that inspire me, um, I've already mentioned Nelson Mandela. I, I loved the fact that Nelson Mandela knew that, you know, there are many leaders. But when I speak about, I did my master's in human, my first master's in human rights and democratization. One of the things that used to demotivate me was why African leaders went, to, why, why things went horribly wrong once an African leader goes, gets into power. Why is it that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely? If you look at leaders who have gone into power, whether you look at the Zimbabwean president, uh, Robert Mugabe, or the Ugandan president, Idi Amin, those leaders started out as, 
as saviors of their people. They started out with good intention. They didn't start out wanting to be horrible leaders. But something, if you look at all of the African leaders that have led and have become dictators, if you look at how they got into power, they were, they got into power for the right reasons, but somewhere along the line, something broke and I'm not sure what, and I'm still trying to figure out what broke and what caused them to turn from being the savior of their people to becoming the oppressor of their people. And therefore, a leader like Nelson Mandela, who understood that leadership is about transformation, but also knowing when to call it is, is a unique, is a unique, it's very unique. Nelson Mandela ran only one term and left as and left and 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 stepped down as the president of South Africa for others to step in. He could have said, Oh, I'm loved. I could lead, lead, lead until I die, but he didn't. And there are very few, there are leaders who need, they're, they're, and I think for me, the lesson to be learned from a man like Nelson Mandela is knowing when you have, when your job is done, if I really want to say it that way. Nelson Mandela knew that his job was done. His job was to uh, emancipate his people his job was to bring a, a democracy into being and to settle the country so that the country does not have bloodshed as part of its legacy. When he achieved that, he stepped down honorably. Many of our leaders don't know when to stop. They don't, when, they don't know when to bow out gracefully. And that's where why I keep saying that, you know, the 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 the, the when we learn that. Um, the ability to learn that to control power and not allow power to control you and to use your, your privilege and authority for the greater good and for the purpose for which it's intended um, is achieved, then, 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 then that's what makes for good leadership. And people like Nelson Mandela is really a, a great role model in that regard. Thank you. And please tell us, how can our listeners connect with you and where should they follow you? So um, I, you can find me on, 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 uh, on LinkedIn, um, either on my personal LinkedIn, you can find me as only, only one area on LinkedIn. You can also follow me on, on Africa Ticons LinkedIn pages, on Africa Ticons Facebook pages, I often am there. You can also contact us on our website on www.africaticonservices.com um, or call or, or, or you can find me on by just calling our office number 011-325-5914. Um, or you can drop me an email, an email on O-N-Y-I-N -N at Africa with a K T I K K U N dot org um i am easily accessible find me on linkedin right. you can I, I will easily connect back on linkedin thank you and last but not least if i may ask you about your leadership legacy what is it you would like to be remembered for i want to be remembered for solving youth unemployment in my lifetime i want you i want to be remembered for giving young people a platform where they can live beyond the politics of the stomach or the politics of bread and butter, where young people are raised as leaders, not just leaders, leaders that leaders that can that can hold that that have it that have a, that have achieved enough to be able to make independent decisions. I'd like to be remembered for that young lady that have left a legacy in her lifetime, a person who the the country the continent and the and and society have become better because i am in it i want to live a life of significance a life where young people just like the young people a lot of young people i have met say to me only because of you i i, I can never have the life that my grandparents or my mothers have i can put food on my table I can put roof over my head. I can pay school fees for my children. My life 
it, my life is fundamentally different because you were in it. And so the legacy I want to leave as a leader is a legacy of raising a generation of leaders, young leaders who poverty is not their challenge. Their challenge will be to take our country and our continent to become what it can be in 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 terms of in in terms of when you compare to other continents so one of my pets my big interest is that africa is so blessed africa deserves to be i don't see why africa cannot compete with uh europe cannot compete with you know north america because we have got what it takes we've got smart people we've got young people a youthful population we've got resources we've got everything it takes to go and compete with the rest of the world and yet we are dependent on aid. Yet we are dependent on, on people to rescue us. So I want to get to the point where I am remembered to have raised a generation that will take Africa, South Africa and Africa and our entire continent to, to go and compete in the way that it deserves to compete with the rest of the continents of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your wisdom into the future of leadership and uh, for inspiring so many future leaders. Thank you, Nick, uh, Dr. Nick. I appreciate that.